Hello and welcome to Mid-American Gardener. I'm your host, Tanisha Spain. Thanks so much for tuning in tonight. We've got a lot of things to get to, some show and tells, some questions, and hopefully from call, some calls from you. But before we get into that, let's introduce our expert panelists and have them tell you a little bit more about their specialty. So we'll start down on the far end. I'm Phil Nixon. I am an entomologist with the University of Illinois. So I answer bug questions. All right, the bug guy. And I'm Kay Carnes. I'm a, a Champaign County Master Gardener, and I like I raise a lot of herbs and vegetables and some flowers. Okay. And I'm Chuck Voigt, and I retired from the Department of Crop Sciences. My responsibilities there were with vegetable crops and herbs, but since Kay's here tonight, <laughs> I'm going to mention that I, when I was at Michigan State in grad school, I actually w was focused on native woody plant materials, so we can cover some of that as well. Okay, mix it all up. We've got a great group, like just like I told you. Okay, so we always do our show and tells first, but before we get into that, we are taking calls tonight. That number is 333-3495. Call in and get your questions answered by the expert. So we'll start with you. What do you got for us? What are we talking about with you? Well, Kay's going to talk about starting seeds, and so I'm going to preempt her and take everything she wanted to talk. No, not quite that. Uh, we're going to talk about fungus gnats, which get into uh, seed beds, and they like damp soil. In fact, uh, some research done a number of years ago at the University of Illinois showed that when you buy your media for planting seeds, stuff that says on the bag, sterile, clean, will sometimes, many times, have fungus gnat eggs in it. So you add water and you get flies. Uh, <laughs> but you get worms in, in between that, and, and the worms are, are kind of clear-like with, uh, with blackheads. and. Uh, and they're, they're up here on the screen now, and they get to be full grown about a quarter of an inch long, so they're kind of small. And then you get, uh, coming out of those will be the fungus gnats themselves, and they're about pinhead size, or a little bit less than that. And they like to fly around and, and make you wonder whether you're seeing floaters in your eyes or, or fungus gnats flying in front of your face. Big problem is, is the larvae will feed on the new roots of those seedlings you're trying to grow up so you have nice tomatoes in, in July. And uh, you know, no no mm -hmm. no roots in in March means no tomatoes in July. So uh, you need to control those, and many times uh, you may want to heat treat your media before you start by putting it in an oven at uh, at least 130 degrees and get it up to that temperature, and then hold it for at least a half an hour. That'll kill everything that's in it, including diseases that might happen to be in that media. Uh, or uh, and then also, if you get to fungus gnats. You can water water until the water comes out the bottom of your uh, of your tray that you're starting your seeds in, and then water with insecticidal soap, and that will be sold in the garden center as insecticidal soap, and that will kill the fungus gnats, but not kill the roots of your plants. If you use some other type of soap, something that you read online that you can use, whatever, uh, you will probably kill the roots better than the fungus gnats, or at least just as well. So uh, use insecticidal soap, spend four or five bucks because you're gonna get $200 worth of tomatoes out of those, right? Or more. Question. Yes. So you didn't see the conversation we had before the show uh, yeah. about me having to uh, deal with fungus gnats because I brought a plant in in the fall that was wet, whatever, we're not talking about that. So my question is, I sort of forgot it. I see that's what I get for in the incessant rambling because I forgot my question. <laughs> we'll come back to it. <laughs> I'm only 38, so <laughs> moving on. Okay, we'll go to you. I got 30 years on you. I, can, I know what <laughs> you're talking about. Yeah. If I remember it, I'll <laughs> ask you. But I forgot it. It's only going to get worse. Make a note. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. <laughs> okay, so Kay, we are talking about seed starting? Yes, we okay. are. <clears throat> um, <clears throat> And I'm assuming they're seeing the picture. Um, not yet. Okay. Can we see Kay's picture mm -hmm. for seed starting? Do we have that ready? There we there go. There it is. Okay. So um, I like to start a lot of my own seeds, um, mainly because I like all kinds of different uh, vegetables and uh, heirlooms, which you don't, can't find in, in nurseries very much. Um, and I just enjoy doing it. So I. This is a picture of my setup. It's kind of changed. Uh, the light at the top um, is an LED grow light, which I invested in 
um, a couple of years ago, and I say invest because they're not cheap, but um, the colors in the light are, are really great for the seedlings, and they're balanced and um, help growth. And um, <clears throat> it's a, not a very big light, but um, it'll you can get two flats um, trays under it, so it's very adequate for my needs. Um, so I sow the seeds in in these little. Um, pots or well they're little plastic pots with six packs six packs yeah mm -hmm. basically and um then i put them under the grow light well i usually cover water the the uh, soil with the seeds in it and then cover it um, with a plastic bag or something till they germinate and uh, once they germinate then i take the bag off and put them under the grow light um, this year i had to buy heat mats because Previously, I had a gas stove with a pilot light, and so I would start all my seedlings in there. And my husband very quickly learned to look in the oven before you turn it on. <laughs> because, um, but that was very effective. But then I bought a new stove this year, so it's uh, got electronic ignition, and I don't have my heat. So I purchased a couple of heating mats. Gotcha. Um, and and they did they've done a really good job. So um, and then I um, since that picture was taken, I have repotted. The plants have gotten big enough. Mm -hmm. I repotted them into in small pots. And um, so I haven't used one of those heat mats before. Um, they're they're kind of small. Yes, but they will. You know, you can get a full mm -hmm. tray on them. Oh, okay. Um, okay. These weren't very expensive, but they don't they don't have a thermostat or anything. Gotcha. You just gotcha. But they were sufficient for starting. Okay. You know the seeds I had, but because you can spend a lot of money on heat mm -hmm. mats. Mm -hmm. um, You'll I, have to update us as your I seeds will. take <laughs> off. I remembered the question. Very good. So in my quest. I bought a product, I was hunting for a product that specifically mentioned fungus gnats on the label. You said insect, insecticidal soap. So is that a blanket insecticidal soap that will work or do you have to get something that mentions fungus gnats? You should get something that mentions fungus gnats on the label. Okay. But if you've talked to your local extension person and they've said that any insecticidal soap will work, that'll be fine, okay. and in fact that does. But as a general rule of thumb, it's a good idea to, unless you have, have been pre-armed with a particular insecticide or other pesticide mm -hmm. from, a, from a reliable source, that, uh, that looking for, for the name of, of the pest you're trying to control mm -hmm. the label will help you get, be more likely to get the right material. Okay. Uh, but, uh, but, the, uh, but generally it's, uh, you know, if you've, if you've contacted your extension office, for instance, and, and University of Illinois Extension, and they've told you to look for this particular product, mm -hmm. and you go mm -hmm. in and, and you ask the sales clerk about that, and they pull it off, and it doesn't say that that particular pest, you should be fine. Okay. As long, but you do need to look and read that what you're going to put it on is going to be on that label. Got it. So, for instance, if you're particularly if you're going to apply it to vegetables, it needs to say vegetables on mm -hmm, that label mm -hmm. because uh, it could have a different carrier if it's used primarily for trees and shrubs. It might be a problem on something you're going to eat. Got it. So okay. So the the, the crop is the most important part more than the pest because you know the worst thing is if you get to run that doesn't have a pest on it, it may not provide the control you're looking for, mm -hmm. but at least you haven't ruined the crop for you to eat. Okay, well, thank you very much. Mm -hmm. We do have calls. We'll get to you in just a second. We're going to let Chuck do his show and tell. So hang on. When we know you're on the line, we'll be right there. All right, sir, what are we going to do first? Well, we're going to talk about these onion sets. Okay. <clears throat> now, we've talked in the past about uh, starting some of the, the sweet onions from seeds. Mm -hmm. uh, a fellow named Man Manuel said, said that that worked out well for him when he heard it last year. Uh, onion sets... Are, are a very effective way to get to get green onions early in the season. Um, you can also get larger dry onions from them, but you mm -hmm. have to realize that the varieties that are selected for onion sets are really good keepers, and pungency is mm -hmm. associated with keeping well. Mm -hmm. So typically the varieties that are used for onion sets are extremely pungent. Mm -hmm. So if you're using them for cooking and those things where it, it kind of gets incorporated, mm -hmm. 
that's okay. Uh, if you're looking for, you know, something like a Vidalia onion or mm -hmm. a Maui sweet mm -hmm. or something that you can eat like candy, mm -hmm. um, you're not going to get it from an onion set. Okay. Um, so typically, how are these packaged and sold? Well, these happen to be bulk at the at the at the big box farm store where I got them. There was a a bin of of yellow and white and red, mm -hmm. um, and I was amazed at how uniform they are mm -hmm. because you want to get uh, medium to small ones because if they're if they start to be as big as this, if they're over about three eighths of an inch in diameter, chances are it's going to make a seed stalk, oh, okay. which mm -hmm. which is okay, which is okay if 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 you're going to pull it as a green onion. Mm -hmm. So if you get straight run, if if you can alternate big ones with smaller ones, mm -hmm. and then and then as as the big ones start to show a seed stock, pull them out, and then if if you have them spaced half as far apart as you want your mm -hmm. onions to grow, you, you just take out the ones that are most likely to uh, to put up a seed stock. <clears throat> so and when, use those oh, as green onions. Yeah, and use them as green onions, exactly. When planting, yes. um, there is a way, right? There is a, a right side up, and so tell us a little bit about that. Okay, well, it you can kind of look and, and you can see the remains of, of roots here on, on this end, and usually the top end is going to be pointier and, and probably have a little bit of last year's top on it because that's how they grow these. They just sow the onion seeds really thickly, mm -hmm. and so they, they keep each other small mm -hmm. and then uh, I think they probably run them through screens so that anything that's bigger than a certain size goes one mm -hmm. place and mm -hmm. anything that's smaller goes somewhere else. Um, if they're if they're too small they don't really have the vigor to come up and really compete yes. really well. Yes. So somewhere in that um, <clears throat> half to three-eighths of an inch you know if they're bulk like this and you have patience you could actually go through and pick the ones that you want. <laughs> Um, or just scoop out a handful. Or there, there's a little there's a little scoop that's gotcha. handy if you just want to put gotcha. it in there. And the, and and I was as I said really amazed at at how uniform and uh, and not huge mm -hmm. uh, these were. So okay. um, with the <clears throat> you know I recommend onion plants for those things where you want big sweet onions. Mm -hmm. For some reason, the market for those has gotten really inflated in the last few years, and so it, it's it's. It's hard to make a, a, a case for them being cost effective when gotcha. they're seven, eight, nine dollars for a bundle. Yes. Which, um, so uh, you might want to start start you know choose a really great variety mm -hmm. like we like we talked about the Elsa Craigs mm -hmm. and, the, mm -hmm. and the Kelsey Giants. Start those from seed, kind of mid to late winter, and then uh, plant them out in, in April or whenever things mm -hmm. get uh, ready to go. Okay. All right. Thank you, sir. All right, we're going to the phones. We've got Bill with a question about raised garden beds. Bill, go ahead. <clears throat> yes, thanks for taking my call. Sure. I built a, a raised garden bed, waist high, out of treated lumber, and I wanted to line it with copper just to preserve the wood. Are there any adverse effects to lining it with copper, or should I just leave it with the natural wood? Any? Did you get that? Everybody hear the question? Is there an adverse effect to copper? Lining the raised bed with copper. But he also used treated wood to make it out of, so that should be a, a flag too, right? Yeah. 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 The question in my mind that, is whether the copper <coughs> that comes off of a, off of a, the lining is worse than might leach out of the, the copper. The, the copper that's in the treated that's wood. The copper that's in the treated wood. Yeah, because so. because the, the the modern treated wood they took the arsenic out. Yeah. But they had to replace it with something else to to kill insects and 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 potentially anything else to try to eat the wood, right? Which kind of gives you a clue on why you don't necessarily <laughs> plant vegetables in there. Well, what? yeah, I, my inclination is that is that I'll, copper, a sheet of copper, might be less likely to leach it than 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 the, than the treated wood would. Yeah. <clears throat> so and the I, treated wood is made with a material. That is supposed to bind forever into the wood fibers and not ever release. It's supposed to, right? But small amounts do, right? And then, yeah. Would would it be a good idea instead to maybe line it with plastic or something like that? Probably that that would. You're be... not going to have as much coming off of that, <clears throat> probably. Right, right. The the, it, the plastic would probably be less dangerous than than the than the copper, and I don't know. Like on a, a galvanized metal, something else, 
<clears throat> if the zinc would be better, worse, or, yeah. or, or otherwise. <clears throat> but overall, we're talking about very, very low levels of, of heavy metals. Right. That the, in all likelihood are not going to be a problem. Okay. I wouldn't necessarily say that, you know, just because you made your raised bed out of, out of treated wood that you would necessarily go out and get rid of it, but you might want to consider lining it with something to Would you provide suggest a little, plastic little, over little copper? extra area of precaution area Probably, associated yes. with it, and, uh, and that might be help. But we are looking at, at minute materials that in a normal situation are unlikely to be a problem, but they could possibly be. So the, the, as, as being the long from term, where we are from, we have, to be, we have to be careful to let you know about that. Yeah, the long term <laughs> problem with, with treated woods is, is if you burn the scraps or if ultimately you, right. you burn the, the wood itself. Or the, the sawdust gets out. Right, the, saw, the, the ash and the, and the sawdust kind of becomes toxic waste. Mm -hmm. So uh, be careful how you, how you uh, get rid of any scraps or if you ultimately tear it out and get rid of it. Okay. Uh, because there's, there's horror stories of mm -hmm. uh, municipalities that use treated lumber and burned it, and, and, and a farmer put the ash on the field. His cows ate the ash, cows died. Okay. So that, that's, that's the ultimate bad story. Okay. But just in your home garden, it's probably not that. Okay. All right, we're going to <coughs> Janet in Clinton with a question about compost. Go ahead, Janet. Uh, thank you. Um, yeah, I wondered what the best compost was to put on my garden because... It just seemed like it needed nutrients really bad last year. I wanted to do it in the spring if that was all right. Okay. Do you recommend or what type mm -hmm. do you recommend? I like I go to the Landscape Recycling Center and get their mushroom compost. Mushroom compost, um, okay. And that's that's my favorite. <laughs> it's oh, in, okay. it's got okay. a nice texture and it um yeah. it, it really that's does all well. I need. So if you yeah. if you if you can get to a landscape recycling center and get the compost that they make there, that mm -hmm. that's mm -hmm. that's a good option. Um, if you make your own, mm -hmm. yeah. you know, just anything that doesn't have a lot of weed seeds in it or any diseased plant material in it, oh. uh, including the leaves that that you might be tempted to bag up and and ship away in the fall, mm -hmm. uh, okay. make a pile out of that yeah. and 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 let it break down and put that on there, or or even work it in in the fall, mm -hmm. which I've done. Mm -hmm. You can get almost up to six inches of leaves tilled in, and by spring, usually it's it's pretty workable. Well, what can I dig in on in the spring? You'd be wanting to buy, buy purchase something or obtain something that has already been composted out, and so it's already a um, has already turned into a black soil-like consistency, mm -hmm. ideally. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I don't know what the situation is in Clinton is, is you know, if they do yeah, landscape so waste composting there or not. You might contact the village or the city, and they might be able to tell you, or go to your closest uh, nursery or landscaping place. Okay, uh, Shirley in Urbana with a question about bagworms. Go ahead, Shirley. Hi, I'm glad to see you back on. Thank you. Last, last fall, um, I noticed bagworms on my quaking aspen. I had someone come over and check it, and he said the spray he would have to put on would be really harmful to the birds and everything. And it was the time of year when all the cone flowers were seeding, and I had all the beautiful little finches. So I left it alone, and I wondered if there was any kind of spray that's a natural spray that would kill them, or if I should just leave them be. Uh, the bagworms that you're talking about, these were, these were about an inch and a half, two inches long and, and cone shaped. Was that correct? Yes. Okay. okay. Just wanted to make sure that whoever you talked to had them identified correctly because another pest called fall webworm is sometimes called colloquially bagworms and it's not correct, but I didn't want to give you the wrong information for a different pest. Uh, bagworms are going to hatch out typically in, uh, in, in the central part of, of uh, mid-America. Uh, around the uh, around the middle part of June, and they're going to and they're going to blow from tree to tree for a couple of weeks, and then settle in at, around the fourth of July. And so about then is a good time to treat for bagworms. And what you would want to use is Bacillus thuringiensis kerstaki. It's not that bad. You go to the garden center and say you're looking for B T K 
or just BT? BTK. BT or BTK? BTK. K is in Kaiser. K is in Kerstaki. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so it's, uh, and, and, and what this is, is this is a, a bacterial toxin. Um, it has uh, really uh, no toxicity to mammals, people or pets or other mammals, or uh, most other things except caterpillars. And it will be very effective, particularly when the bagworms are young, which would be in, uh, in the early part of July. It will still provide good control later in the season. Probably what happened in your situation is, is that you were, uh, you were, uh, they were so far, far along that he probably figured he needed to use a pyrethroid for that and used in a proper way that's totally safe. Uh, he probably gave you a little more of a, of a, of a uh, scare tactic than you really needed. But, uh, but the uh, BTK will work very, very well. And uh, some of the trade names are Dipel or Thuricide. But there's a slew of others that usually have, you know, worm death or something like this. <laughs> the brand name. It's all kinds of strange names. Okay. Uh, they really get exciting, but that'll work very well. And it's sprayed on the foliage so that the uh, caterpillars will eat it and, uh, and die as a result. It doesn't hurt the birds at all. Doesn't hurt the birds at all. Doesn't hurt the bees at all. <coughs> doesn't hurt any other insect except a caterpillar. All right. Dorothy in Urbana with a question about Chuck's radish. <laughs> Chuck strikes again. Go ahead, Dorothy. Hi. Uh, last week, Chuck had a beautiful red radish that was kind of ugly brown on the outside, but when he sliced it, it was beautiful. But I didn't get the name of it. Take it away, Chuck. Uh <laughs> Sometimes called watermelon radish. I think it probably has some other common names, but I was just perusing seed racks today when I was trying to think what I was going to bring in, and, and I saw a seed packet, and it was called watermelon radish. Okay. And remember, it's a, it's a fall radish, not a spring radish. Mm -hmm. I've never had success growing it in the spring. So yeah. uh, it, something about the day length and the temperature and all that stuff, it works better in the fall. So. Okay. All right, Patty in Springfield with a question about limes in the ground. Go ahead, Patty. Okay, my question is: I the ground has never been worked with, and it's and it's hard, and it's 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 charcoaly, and I don't know, you know, um, should we put lime on it? Is it like not you're not supposed to in the springtime, or you know, just to, to sweeten up the ground a little bit? I'm not real sure. Don't put um, lime on anything until you've done a soil test mm -hmm. that shows that you need lime, because especially if it hasn't had anything to, to, done to it uh, natively over a lot of mid-America, uh, the soils are fairly young and fairly high in pH already, and so uh, just uh, adding lime can cause problems as opposed to curing them. Um, we're, we're, where you see farm fields where they're where they're spreading lime in the fall, uh, that's because they're using uh, nitrogen fertilizers that, in the course of particularly anhydrous ammonia, which which acidifies the soil as it as it turns into usable forms of nitrogen. Um, but do a soil test if the pH is is not below six. Don't worry about lime. Use organic matter and and other kinds of, of things to to break up the soil uh, rather than just lime. Okay. All right. We got Lisa and Savoy with a question about voles. Lisa, go ahead. Well, my question is, I had a terrible vole infestation last year, and I have a small garden in front of my deck. That's just the way these condos are, and I had more than voles. I had voles, and I had probably shrew, something with real pointy noses too. And I trapped about 10 to 12 of them with little mouth traps last year and apple and peanut butter. But then they were all gone. And then when it snowed in the winter, they started coming back. But they were actually outside of our wall on the condo common area. And they've, they've got all these little tunnels in the grass. And they're going under the decks. So I'm afraid I'm going to have the same problem I had last year. But I didn't feed the birds this year at all. I didn't feed them at all. And I just don't know how to keep them from ruining my garden. It's not a very big garden, but I have quite a few native and flowering plants in it. And it just seems like they just really ruin it every year. And, they, and I, I don't know what to do anymore because the condo association won't really do anything about the problem. The important thing to realize is that voles are, are meadow mice. 
there at the bottom of so many food chains that makes your head spin. And so uh, essentially, if they are exposed, natural predators, cats, dogs, owls, weasels, uh, raccoons, skunks, all sorts of things will eat the voles. And so if you remove their, their, their cover, and usually that cover is going to be in a form of ground covers or very deep, heavy mulching, these sorts of things, if you reduce that and remove that cover, then, uh, then the, uh, the natural predators that are in your area come through your yard every, e every evening through, during the night. They will find these, eat them, reduce the problem. And in, in fact, uh, the, the little pointed nose shrews that you were finding are one of the number one predators of voles, although the vole is twice the size of a shrew. They are mean enough and nasty <laughs> enough to take them out on a very small scale. Get They're way out. too gigantic to, uh, for a shrew to, to take on, but yeah. uh, if a shrews were as large as us, they would be serious predators. It would make us. a great horror film. Oh, it would be a horror <laughs> film. The, the, the giant shrew. <laughs> the shrew that ate, ate Cleveland, yeah. Well, thank you guys so much for coming. We had a great show tonight. And thank you for calling in and sending your questions. Please keep them coming. Uh, reach out to us on our socials or send us an email at yourgarden at gmail.com. And we'll see you next time. Mm -hmm.